good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ron Jaffa, president of the UVA Club of Fairfield Westchester, and we thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we have 208 registrants. Uh, last time I looked, and so far uh, we're up to 67 as you're logging in. So uh, I just wanted to get started um, and give a short intro for our uh, speaker tonight. Um, our number of registrants is a record for any event our club has held. So great thanks are due to Robin Stafford, our regional engagement officer at UVA for coordinating this event, to the UVA communications team for getting the message out on multiple platforms and to our club board for all its support. And most of all, a thank you to our featured speaker, Mark Selberstone, for taking the time out of his busy schedule to be here with us tonight. Um, Mark's an associate professor in presidential studies at the Miller Center at UVA and chair of the center's presidential recordings program and uh, hails from Westport, Connecticut and a graduate of Staples High School there. So there may be others uh, uh, from Westport and Staples graduates. So you're in good company tonight. Uh, um, Mark's gonna provide us with an overview of the recordings program established by the center in 1998 with highlights of secretly taped meetings and phone conversations from various presidents. He'll also tell us what he and his team are now working on as well as his, as his current project on President Kennedy and Vietnam. As chair of the recordings program, Mark edits the secret White House tapes of presidents John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, and Richard M. Nixon. He's the general editor of the presidential recordings digital edition the primary online portal for transcripts of the tapes published by the University of Virginia Press. Mark earned a BA degree in philosophy from Trinity College, a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University, and a PhD in history from Ohio University. A historian of the Cold War, he's author of The Kennedy Withdrawal, Camelot and the American Commitment to Vietnam, published by Harvard forthcoming in 2022 and constructing the monolith, the United States, Great Britain and international communism, 1945 to 1950, also Harvard 2009, which won the Stuart L. Bernath Book Prize from the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. Um, if there's time, Mark will answer your questions at the close, which you can submit on the Q&A um, tab at the bottom of your screen. So with that, I'll pass uh, this over to him. Welcome, Mark. Uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. Thanks, Ron. Uh, and thanks to your whole team for setting this up. Uh, I'm really pleased to be with you on uh, the heels of this President's Day. Uh, it's a great time to look back on presidential history uh, at the same time that we're trying to understand this, this really difficult uh, and significant moment of history that we're, we're in right now and, and living through. Uh, especially the the events of, of the last couple of days, but we'll we'll take a look back and and maybe that will help to put some of what we're currently living through in, in some kind of perspective. Uh, we're here on the 22nd of February, um, the 290th birthday of George Washington. I remember when February 20 we had uh, February 22nd off uh, for Washington's birthday and February 12th off for Lincoln's birthday. Now uh, combined into into one single President's Day. Um, uh, we're also speaking about the presidency at a time when there's greater public interest in uh, presidential records, uh, given what the previous president had done with his own. Uh, so that has been in the news. Uh, we're also uh, speaking about presidents uh, on the heels of last night's and the nights before. Um, CNN program on LBJ, uh, which I thought was a fabulous four part series on the Johnson presidency, uh, the tumultuous time that that was from 63 really through January 69. Uh, and that forms uh, an important part of, of the work that we do at the Miller Center and the recordings program. Uh, and it was significant that in last night's and the, the night uh, before's episodes, um, the tapes were really the star of the show, I think. Uh, the video, the imager, imagery was fantastic, uh, some I had never seen before. But having a chance to listen to Johnson speak with a variety of private individuals, his own aides, 
to get a sense of what was in his own mind from his own mouth is really irreplaceable. And so that's the material that I get a chance to work with every day at the Miller Center. And uh, it's what I have a chance to, to share with you tonight. And so one of the interesting questions that comes up about this, and it's one I had wondered when I, I started this work, uh, back in 2000, I've been at the Miller Center now for uh, coming up on 22 years, is how did these materials even come to light? Uh, and moreover, how is it that we, we got access to them? Because these are presidential records. They should be classified. These, sh these should never see the light of day, or at least that was the thought at, at one time. And as with so much in modern American political life, uh, the threads really go back to Richard Nixon. Uh, in the summer of 1973, with congressional inquiries into the Watergate scandal really heating up, uh, the former Deputy Chief of Staff, Alexander Butterfield, testified before the Senate Watergate Committee and revealed that President Nixon did indeed have listening devices set up in the White House. Uh, he had them in the Oval Office, but he also had them in the Cabinet Room, in his office uh, next door at the executive office building, the Eisenhower executive office building. He also had them uh, in the residential quarters at the White House, as well as at Camp David. So this is an extraordinary, rich and voluminous trove of presidential materials that, that the Watergate um, investigators wanted to get their hands on. Uh, Nixon stonewalled in turning them over. He at uh, first, um, said that he would provide his own summaries of these and then transcripts of these and then and then hand them over. Uh, that wasn't good enough for the, the Senate committee, nor was it good enough for the uh, independent counsel that was looking into these matters. Uh, there was haggling back and forth about their disposition. Ultimately, it came down to the Supreme Court, which decided by a vote of eight to nothing, um, suggesting that were indicating that Nixon's claim of executive privilege did not matter here because uh, these materials were relevant to criminal cases uh, that were then pending. And so Nixon gave had to give up these tapes. And once the investigators got a chance to listen to them, and particularly a tape from June of 1972, uh, about a week or so after the break-in at the Democratic National Headquarters uh, at the Watergate uh, Hotel Complex, it became clear that Nixon had engaged in obstruction of justice. And once uh, the, the relevant committees who were considering impeachment at the time, the House Judiciary Committee was considering impeachment at the time, once they got a hold of this, and not only the Democrats, but the Republicans heard this, it was clear that the game was up. And um, Nixon realized that he would not be able to survive a floor vote of the House uh, and he would, in fact, be impeached. Uh, the, the Judiciary Committee uh, voted uh, affirmatively to send those articles to the floor. And so Nixon ends up resigning the office of the presidency uh, at the end of the first week of August uh, 1974. But uh, with uh, those criminal cases still ongoing, um, and Nixon quite honestly, still having jurisdiction over those materials, because at the time it was believed that they were his personal property, Congress decided to act and passed a law in December of 1974, the, the Presidential Recordings and Materials Preservation Act, in which Congress claimed jurisdiction over those materials, didn't want to see them destroyed uh, and wanted to preserve them for history, but also because Again, they were still uh, relevant to, to ongoing cases. Uh, four years later, Congress took an even more significant step when it passed the Presidential Records Act, which transformed these materials, these records, from the private property of the president's individuals to the public property of the United States. So they now became ours. Uh, and uh, it, it uh, was left up to the presidential libraries where these materials were being stored from, from previous presidents about what to do with them, which leads into uh, a, a very interesting, interesting question of how many presidents have, have really done this uh, during their, their time in office? When did it start uh, and when did it end? 
Uh, after Butterfield had disclosed that there was a taping going on in the Nixon White House, uh, the questions went out to the head of the Kennedy Library, Dan Fenn, and the head of the, the Johnson Library, um, Harry Middleton, did those presidents tape? And Arthur Schlesinger, uh, who was a Kennedy acolyte, had written on Kennedy famously, Pulitzer Prize winning book in 1965, when he heard that, uh, that Nixon had taped and was then asked about Kennedy, he said, Kennedy never would have done that. He was far too smart to do anything that stupid. And of course, Fenn said, yes, indeed, President Kennedy did tape. And Harry Middleton said the same thing about the Johnson tapes. So now we were off to the races. These two other presidents taped. Who else taped? And that leads us back to um, Franklin Roosevelt, who began the regime of surreptitious presidential taping. Other presidents have, have taped their materials. And we can go in, into, the, into the future and fast forward to Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, who taped their conversations largely with journalists um, so that they knew uh, exactly what was said if they needed to, um, to, to con consult that in the future. But the practice of taping their conversations in secret without anybody else in the room knowing that they were being taped, whether those were cabinet officials, uh, presidential aides, and again, uh, private individuals who were coming into the White House, that began with, uh, with Franklin Roosevelt. Now, Roosevelt only taped about eight hours of material. Uh, the Miller Center, in fact, beginning in July, is going to begin a project on the Roosevelt tapes, uh, and it should be very exciting. We'll be able to finish that up over the course of, of the academic year and then publish shortly thereafter. But it wasn't just Roosevelt. Harry Truman taped. Uh, he didn't like the whole prospect of taping. He thought it was unethical, uh, unethical as did Roosevelt as well. Roosevelt taped from uh, August of 1940 until just after he was elected in, in November of 1940 and then never taped again. Uh, he was uncomfortable with, with doing so. Truman was very uncomfortable with doing so after finding out from FDR um, and FDR's aides really that, that, that FDR had taped. Truman tried it a couple times, but, but he didn't want anything more to do with it. And so really after April of 1945, uh, he didn't touch it. Dwight Eisenhower taped a little bit, uh, four or five hours or so, um, really idiosyncratic. It's hard to get a, a good sense of rhyme or reason as to why he taped uh, when he did. Uh, the best we can determine is that it seemed to be conversations that might have been sensitive uh, that he wanted a record of. But the golden age of taping really begins with JFK. Uh, and uh, Kennedy begins taping in the summer of 1962, and that lasts right through into November of 1963, about 260 hours of material. Uh, that is both um, telephone tape uh, and meeting tape. The vast majority of those are meeting tapes. Lyndon Johnson carried on uh, the tradition of taping. Uh, Johnson, who had also taped while he was vice president, uh, began taping uh, from the very moment that he became president. And we have 800 hours of LBJ material, about 650 of them on the telephone and about 150 uh, of them being meeting tapes. But it's Richard Nixon who wins the award for uh, the greatest uh, taping scheme that, that we have seen of these presidents. 3,400 hours of Nixon material was taped from February of 1971 through July of 1973. And the reason that there are so many Nixon tapes uh, is because he was using a voice activated system. So every time that he stepped into a room with a beeper on his, on his belt buckle, uh, uh, a, a voice activated recorder would kick off. And so whether Nixon was speaking with aides, whether he was watching TV and then left the room and the TV stayed on, that would be captured as well, which is why we have hours and hours of uh, Washington, I'll say the name, Washington Redskins football games, because that was the name of the team at the time. How is it that the Miller Center uh, comes to, to take this on? In 1998, uh, Philip Zellico, who had moved from Harvard to uh, the University of Virginia to be director of the Miller Center, uh, had been involved in a project to transcribe the Kennedy Cuban Missile Crisis tapes. 
And Philip brought that project with him from Harvard to uh, the University of Virginia and thought that, well, why we're, while we're taping the, the missile crisis tapes, that's great, that's, that's 13 days or so. Uh, let's see if we can tape the entire corpus of Kennedy materials, which stretched again to 260 hours, but then let's go further and try to transcribe all of the presidents who taped. And so the presidential recordings program began in, in 98 at the Miller Center, and we're going strong. As Ron mentioned, we've been doing this for, for 24 years now. Uh, and at the end of the, the, the conversation here, I'll uh, give you a better sense of how you can access these materials uh, yourself. But I wanna play some tapes for you and give you a, a sense of, of, of what's on them. Uh, we're going to jump from Kennedy to Johnson to Nixon, uh, and we'll see how many I can get through uh, before we turn to Q&A, because I know that uh, there will be a lot of questions about this. So let's start with JFK, and it's a, it's a tape that is important for me, for my work. Uh, I've just completed a manuscript on Kennedy in Vietnam, and uh, the focus was not necessarily on a comprehensive soup to nuts Kennedy in Vietnam, those kinds of narratives are out there and they're, they're uh, worthwhile and valuable. I was interested in a smaller segment of the Kennedy Vietnam story, which relates to his planning to withdraw the United States from Vietnam by 1965. Uh, lots, has been, lots have been written about this recently. And because of some material that Kennedy taped, we have a way to try to get to the bottom of what Kennedy was thinking about Vietnam writ large, but also what he was thinking about with respect to this planning that had been going on since the summer of 1962 to get the United States out by 1965, a time when he expected that he would still be, be president. So the conversation we're gonna hear is from early October, 1963. It will feature uh, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Maxwell Taylor. They have just come back from a fact-finding trip to Vietnam, and they deliver to Kennedy this report, which says a variety of things about the way the, the administration should be handling uh, a really troublesome ally in Godin Diem, the president of South Vietnam. But more than that, they give Kennedy a plan to extricate the United States from this conflict that looked like it was in in some trouble at the time. So we're gonna hear Kennedy ask about this thousand, that's a thousand troops to get out by the end of 1963. We'll also hear from Kennedy's national security advisor with George Bundy, uh, Maxwell Taylor, again, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and George Ball, who's the number two at the State Department. We're gonna hear three excerpts in this clip. The first two are from a morning meeting when Kennedy and just a couple of other aides are meeting with uh, uh, Taylor and, and, and McNamara. And then the last segment, this third excerpt, and you'll hear the, the difference in the, the quality of the tape itself. That comes from an evening session of the National Security Council when uh, they're debating what they should say to the public about this. Should they announce that they're gonna get the United States out by the, the end of 65? So it's a fascinating, four minutes or so of a conversation. Listen to McNamara, the quality of his voice. This is a man who later um, embraced the notion that Vietnam was McNamara's war. So Kennedy, McNamara, Taylor from October of 63. Uh, 
we, we need a way to get out of Vietnam. This is the way of doing it. And to leave forces there when they're not needed, I think is wasteful and, and uh, uh, complicates both their problem and ours. The question that occurs to me is whether we want to get publicly pinned to a date in 6A. Well, that goes back to Arabic too. Right? Yes, it does. It's, uh, but it's something we debated very strong. Yeah. Well, I think it is a major question. I would just say this, that uh, we've talked to 174 officers, uh, Vietnamese and U.S., and uh, in the case of the U.S., uh, I always ask the question, when can you finish this job in the sense that you will reduce this insurgency to a little more than sporadic interest? Uh, inevitably, except from the Delta, they, they would say 64 would be ample time. I realize that's not necessarily, assuming no major factor, new factors in any situation. I realize that's uh, well, I'll tell you it anyway, and then 65 is a good job. I, I think, Mr. President, we must have a means of disengagement from this area. We must show our country that way. And the only, the only slight of the difference between Mac and Moon is the tire report is in this one estimate of whether or not we can win the war at 64 and the upper three territories in 65 and 4. I'm not entirely sure of that, but I am sure that if we don't meet those dates in the sense of ending the major military campaign, we nonetheless can withdraw the bulk of our U.S. forces according to the schedule we've laid out for the job because we can train the people to do the job. So that withdrawal, the thousand man withdrawal actually did go through uh, in, uh, in early December of 1963. Of course, JFK was not around when that happened. That was under Lyndon Johnson. And, uh, and shameless plug that it is, it, my book, uh, I, I cover uh, Johnson's approach to the withdrawal policy. And, and as we know, that, that never fully went through because by the end of 1964, Johnson was conducting reprisal strikes on North Vietnam, and then into 1965, more sustained strikes with Rolling Thunder bombing. And then by the middle of 1965, 100,000 troops were going in. Uh, that would rise to um, over half a million by 1968. But LBJ is a fascinating character, not only with respect to Vietnam, but with respect to power. And uh, Bob Caro's wonderful work on LBJ really is a study of power. And I want to play a couple of clips from LBJ that gives you a sense of how he wielded that power. Uh, one of them comes from just 10 days or so after he became president. It's a conversation between Johnson and uh, Jackie Kennedy, uh, the late president's widow. Uh, and it's notable for a variety of reasons, but particularly for Johnson, who knows that he is 
um, going to need to uh, stay in the good graces of the Kennedy family. He has picked up the mantle from the fallen president. He's trying to, to pass Kennedy's legislative agenda, tax cuts, uh, foreign aid, and then eventually civil rights. Uh, and then he's going to need to go into a 1964 presidential campaign, not alienating the Kennedy forces, which will be a real challenge given where we know Bobby Kennedy will be at that time. So here he is early in this process, sweet talking Jackie Kennedy uh, and she doing it back to him, which gives you just as much a sense of, of how, um, how much Jackie was a political player in her own right. So here is uh, LBJ and Jackie Kennedy from early December, 1963. Mr. President. I just wanted you to know you were loved and by so many and so much. Oh, Mr. I'm President, one of them. I tried. I didn't dare bother you again, but I got Kenny O'Donnell over here to give you a message. If he ever saw you, did he give it to you yet? No. About my letter no. that, that was waiting for me last night. Listen, sweetie, now, first thing you got to learn, you got some things to learn, and one of them is that you don't bother me. You give me strength. But I wasn't going to send you in one more letter. And I was don't just scared you'd anything. answer. Don't send me anything. You just come over and put your arm around me. That's all you do. When you haven't got anything else to do, let's take a walk. Let's walk around the backyard and uh, oh. just let me let me tell you how much you mean to all of us and how we can carry on if you give us a little strength. But you know what I want to say to you about that letter. I know how rare a letter is in the president's handwriting. Do you know that I've got more in your handwriting than I do in Jack's now? Oh, and for you to write it at this time and then to send me that thing today of, you know, your tape announcement and everything. I want you to just know this, that I told my mama a long time ago, when everybody else gave up about my election in 48, yeah. my mother and my wife and my sisters and you females got a lot of courage that we men don't have. And so we have to rely on you and depend on you, and you've got something to do. You've got the president relying on you, and this is not the first thing you have. So, so there are not many women, you know, run around with a good many presidents. So you just, uh, you just try that in mind. You got the biggest job of your he life. He ran around with two presidents. That's what they'll say about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anytime. Well, goodbye, darling. Thank you for goodbye. calling, Mr. President. Bye, goodbye. Sweetie. Do come back. I will. So that's one version of the Johnson treatment. Uh, here's another one. Uh, which is a little bit more pointed. Uh, and it's visited upon uh, Sergeant Shriver, uh, the late president's uh, brother-in-law, uh, current director of the Peace Corps in February of 1964. Johnson wants Shriver to wear two hats. He wants him to be not only head of the Peace Corps, but he wants him to run this new program on the war on poverty. Uh, Johnson, in his State of the Union from, from uh, early that January, had declared an unconditional war on poverty. Uh, and uh, Shriver would be a great person to run this because of the Kennedy ties, the continuity of, of uh, his links to the administration. He's a great administrator. Um, and Johnson is also thinking about uh, who should be his running mate uh, come November. Some people were talking up Shriver. This is a nice way to sideline Shriver. Of course, some people are going to talk up Bobby as well, and Johnson will have his ways to sideline Bobby too. Uh, but here uh, in uh, February of 1964, Johnson is really going to put the screws to Shriver. You're going to be my man uh, to run this program. And just one reference that you'll hear made when Shriver says, well, I think the person who should run this is Bill. Uh, that Bill is Bill Moyers, who was actually Shriver's deputy at the time uh, running the Peace Corps. So here's, El here's a real good uh, example of, of the Johnson treatment. Mark, 
Good morning, Mr. President. How are you? I'm going to announce your appointment at that press conference. What press conference? Sir, sure. no. Well, God, I think it, uh, it would be uh, advisable, if you don't mind, if uh, I could have uh, uh, this weekend, I wanted to sit down with a couple of people and see what we could get in the way of some sort of a plan, because what happens, at least my thought is, that what happens is that you, you announce somebody or hear somebody else, and they don't know what the hell they're doing or what the program's going to be specifically, and who's going to carry it. Then you're, you're in a hell of a hole because we, they we, start calling you up and saying, well, now, what are you going to do? Well, carry this out and all that, and you don't well uh, just don't talk to them. Just go away and go to Cam David and figure it out. We need something to say to the press. We've got to say to them, and I've got to tell them what I talked to you about yesterday. And you can just take off, work out your Peace Corps any way you want to. You can be head of the committee and have some acting operator. If you want Bill to help you, I'll let him do that. I'll do anything, but I want to announce this and get it behind me. So I keep quit getting all these other pressures, and uh, I I think you're gonna, you've got to do it. You just can't let me down. So the quicker we get it behind us, the better. And, uh, you can talk to them as special assistant to the president a hell of a lot easier, and you can talk to them just as peace administrator. And if they if they, if they want to talk to you, you can tell them uh, speak for me. Yes. Well, uh, Mr. President. But don't make don't don't make me wait till next week because I won't satisfy this press with something. I told them we're going to have a press meeting. Well, let me say this: that I they're going to they're going to have all these damn questions, and I don't want to be indecisive about them. If you can't run a hundred million program in your left hand and a billion with your right hand, you're not as smart as I think you are. <laughs> the, side, the money's got that's no problem at all. It's the people that I'm in. Well, the people. Uh, uh, I want to keep all these people for the government that are in the Peace Corps and bring them into any other program so that they. Well, that's good. I'm not going to sever you from the Peace Corps at all. I'm going to say that you're going to maintain your identification with the Peace Corps. And how much of the details you do, whether you hire them or sweep out the room, is going to be a matter for you to determine. And I'm going to make that clear. But I am going to make it clear that you're Mr. Poverty. And uh, a home and abroad, you ought to be. And I don't care who you have run the Peace Corps. If you can run it, wonderful. If you can't, get Oshkosh from Chicago, and I'll name it. I can't get uh, anybody. The only guy that could possibly do it, uh, uh, Mr. President, is Bill. Well, you can write your ticket. You can write your ticket on anything you want to do there. I want to get rid of poverty, though. Yeah. And uh, you can organize the poverty right from the beginning. And you, you'll have to get on the message Monday. But the Sunday paper is going to say it's you, Mr. Poverty, unless uh, you've got real compelling reasons, which I haven't heard. And I'm going to say that you're going to maintain your identification with the Peace Corps and operate it to such an extent as you may think desirable. There are lots of other great examples of, of the Johnson uh, treatment, uh, and I'll, I'll direct you to some later. Uh, but now Richard Nixon. Uh, Nixon started taping in, in February of 1971, uh, and it's an opportune time for us, thinking back on, on those years, because it allows us to catch some of the early developments in his planning for an opening to China. It allows us to hear how he's thinking about arms control with the Soviet Union. Uh, he starts taping uh, less than two weeks after the incursion into Laos. Uh, so it's an, a pretty Im important moment. Um, this conversation from, from that summer uh, comes a day after uh, Nixon presided in a Rose Garden Sarah, uh, wedding of, of his daughter, Trisha, which you can see in column one of the Times right here. But what was most important about the news that day in the New York Times was what appeared in uh, the middle columns about this Pentagon Papers study. Uh, this is what would come to be known as the Pentagon Papers, which was the secret uh, Department of Defense study uh, that looked back at U.S. relations with Vietnam from 1945 through 1967. And it takes Al Haig to focus Richard Nixon's attention on this, which he does in this phone call uh, that Sunday morning. General Haig, sir. 
Hello. Yes, sir. Hi, Al. How, uh, what about the casualties, Leslie? You got the figure yet? Uh, no, sir, but I think it's going to be quite low. Uh, mm -hmm. It should be as should be last week or better. Yeah, it should be less than 20. 20, I would think, yeah. So it'll be very... Hey, uh, when do you get that? Do you, would you know? Uh, we don't get it officially until Monday afternoon, uh, mm -hmm. but we can get a reading on it. Right, well, Monday afternoon, officially, well, let's wait till then. All right. Okay. Nothing else of interest in the world? Yes, sir. Very, very significant, this uh, goddamn New York Times expose of the most highly classified documents of the war. Oh, that. I see. That, that, I didn't read the story, but uh, you mean that, that was leaked out of the Pentagon? Sir, it, uh, the whole study that was done for McNamara and then carried on after McNamara left by Clifford and the peaceniks over there, this is a devastating uh, security breach of, of the greatest magnitude of anything I've well, ever seen. Well, what, uh, what's being done about it then? I mean, I didn't... Uh, well, I did we know this was coming out? No, we did not, sir. Uh, yeah. There are just a few copies of this. Well, what about the... Volume report. But what about the... Uh, let me ask you this, though. What about the... Uh, what about Laird? What's he going to do about it? Is, uh, well, I... Uh, now, I, I just start right at the top and fire some people. I mean, whoever, whatever department it came out of, I'd fire the top guy. Yes, sir. Well, I'm sure it came from defense, and I'm sure it was stolen at, at the time of the turnover of the administration. Oh, it's two years old, then. I'm sure it is, and they've been holding it for a juicy time, and I think they've thrown it out to affect Hatfield McGovern. That's my own estimate. But it's it's something that it's a mixed bag. It's a, it's a tough attack on Kennedy. Uh, it shows that the genesis of the war uh, really occurred. Yeah, 61. Yeah, there. that's Clifford. Yeah, I see. And uh, it's brutal on President Johnson. They're going to end up in a massive gut fight in the Democratic Party on this thing. Are they? It's a, there's some uh, very... But also massive against the war. Against the war. Uh, but it's a Pentagon study, huh? Yeah, it was indeed. And uh, over the next few days... Nixon would, would think about this more and more. What did it mean that these materials were leaked? And he started to get really scared because he was concerned that there was another study uh, floating around Washington that might get leaked. And that study contained the history of the 1968 presidential election right down at the wire when Nixon and his campaign kind of monkeyed around with the possibility of peace talks, starting with the, the North and South Vietnamese. Uh, and this is what came to be known as the Chenault Affair. And Nixon uh, uh, fears that um, there is material related to this Chenault Affair and what's called the bombing halt file in a safe at Brookings. Uh, the story goes that Johnson had announced a bombing halt uh, on October 31st, 1968, theoretically, as far as Nixon knew, so he could swing that election to Hubert Humphrey, the Democratic candidate. Up until then, uh, Nixon had a double-digit lead, but Humphrey had really narrowed things down uh, the last week or so of the campaign. And if it became known that there was not only uh, the possibility of, of peace talks, but that all the parties were going to go to them, then wow, Humphrey might have gotten a really big boost from this. So the Nixon campaign decides to move in, tells the South Vietnamese to stay away from it, and Humphrey gets no bump. But Johnson knew about it because he had FBI, CIA, NSA material indicating that the Nixon campaign was monkeying around. And Nixon thinks that all of that material is in a safe in this bombing halt file at the Brookings Institution. So on June 17th, Nixon and key aides, Bob Haldeman, chief of staff, John Ehrlichman, domestic policy advisor, and Henry Kissinger, his national security advisor, talk about this in the Oval Office. And it's this conversation and some others that's going to lead Nixon to try to plug up this and other leaks, which will lead him to create the plumbers. Uh, and the plumbers leads right into Watergate. Uh, this is one of the conversations you can hear uh, on the Miller Center website, uh, and I'd like to play it for you, but I also want to give you an opportunity to, to ask some questions. So uh, let's let's hold on to this for a while, uh, and let me, let me just tell you a couple other things before we break and, and, and then open it up. Um, I think that these materials are, are just golden. 
uh, for our purposes, uh, particularly in living in a democracy because they provide some sense of transparent, uh, transparency and accountability. Um, it gives us a sense of how power is wielded in the people's name. Uh, and it's important to be able to, to look back at this, to, to see how decisions were made on key matters, uh, because they, the questions that are being asked then can certainly help inform the kinds of questions that we should be asking in the present. So I think they're wonderful for, for that purpose. Uh, the tapes also humanize the president. It gives us a much better sense of who these, these guys, and at some point, we hope gals, will be a, as president. Um, and at least in Johnson's case, as we heard from the, the series the last couple of nights, it gives us a much better sense about what he really thought. I mean, no longer can we really argue that Lyndon Johnson was a warmonger on Vietnam after hearing what he was really saying to his aides in private. So that's helpful. The tapes allow us to uh, understand a little bit more about how policy is made in real time, about how what a president reads in the paper that day can affect who he decides to speak with, uh, the arguments that he, he makes. You can see the evolution of policy as it's happening. And that's a, a real boon to us as historians. And then furthermore, they help to, to either correct or shape the historical record because there are recordings of conversations for which there are no written memoranda at all. The Kennedy tape that I played for you, in fact, um, there is no what's called a memcon, a memorandum of conversation. It doesn't exist for that first that first uh, clip from the morning of October 2nd. So all we have really is the tape. And because of that, we can hear Kennedy saying, well, look, if 65 doesn't work out uh, for getting the troops out of Vietnam, we'll simply get a new date. We'll push it back. And what does that mean for Kennedy's willingness to stick around in Vietnam uh, and maybe fight hard, harder or at least not to pull the troops out if the war wasn't going well. So for a variety of reasons, these materials are extraordinary and, uh, and I feel really quite privileged to be able to, to work on them. You can listen to them, uh, particularly the LBJ tapes uh, through lbjtapes.org. It's a project that we've entered into with the Lyndon Johnson Library and Foundation. Uh, you can scroll and browse through uh, and uh, get uh, over 100 clips uh, like you've seen before here on Vietnam, uh, civil rights, the war on poverty, uh, on Johnson, kind of the man, uh, and a variety of other topics. Uh, and this is all free of charge. Uh, and we're hoping to do something comparable for the other presidents in, in working with the other presidential libraries as well. Our gold-plated material that we publish through UVA Press uh, comes through this Presidential Recordings Digital Edition. And if, if some of you out there have the ability to VPN into a UVA network, you can access these. Unfortunately for others, uh, there is a paywall. And we are currently in conversation and we've been in conversation with the press and with other units at the university for a while to try to make these open access. Because I think it's one of my goals is to, to make sure that uh, students across the country have access to all of these tapes. Uh, what better way to help teach American history, at least, at least modern American political history, than hearing the words of Lyndon Johnson or John F. Kennedy or, or Richard Nixon. And then finally, uh, you can read more about the history of the recordings themselves and each of the president's uh, approaches to recording through the material that we publish on millercenter.org and through the, the in, uh, informational pages that we have for the presidential ro uh, recordings program. You can get that background on the tapes. You can also get some more of these digital exhibits like the ones I've played today. And then if you're really ambitious and you wanna listen and just kind of poke around, you can download every single audio file that exists because we've uploaded them to our website and this is all available free of charge. So with that, let me stop and uh, and take your questions. Thank you again, Mark. Uh, that was a fascinating talk. Uh, it's amazing uh, listening to uh, the secret recordings. Uh, I'd never heard any of those before. And uh, I mean, literally thousands of hours. Uh, so I appreciate your distilling them down for uh, a few clips to give us an idea of 
what exactly uh, is in the treasure trove of materials. Um, it looks like we have a few questions. Uh, if anyone again wants to ask Mark anything, uh, um, just jot it in the Q and A uh, uh, tab down at the bottom of your computer. And uh, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, Mark has graciously agreed to uh, um, answer some questions. So one had actually come in earlier um, in the day and it was who's the earliest president that we have recordings of their voice, Grant McKinley. I think I've heard Teddy Roosevelt. Thank you. And that's from uh, Bunny Shepherd. Yeah, it's actually uh, Benjamin Harrison. Uh, I consulted with one of our archivists at the Miller Center and he was able to provide a link uh, to a Harrison clip. Uh, it doesn't say a whole lot, uh, it's a little scratchy, uh, but uh, that answers the question at least as, as to who was number one. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that had come in during your uh, presentation um, says, uh, what triggered the taping prior to Nixon or did the president have to click on something to start the taping? That's from yeah. an anonymous question. Uh, it was a, a combination of things. So for Kennedy, uh, and let's stick with Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon for now. For Kennedy, uh, he had a, a switch um, in the knee well of his desk that he could flick if he was there. Um, he also had a dictaphone that he would use. So it was quite consciously pressing the buttons and Kennedy would record memoirs, in fact, of, uh, of his reflections on a day. Um, there was also a switch at Kennedy's place in the cabinet room uh, that he could flick and it would turn on those microphones, which themselves were placed behind the, uh, the curtains uh, behind him. So uh, it was a manually operated system for Kennedy. For Johnson, he would largely signal to his secretaries. Uh, oftentimes the door was open uh, between Johnson and, and an outer office and he would kind of turn his fingers around, swirl his fingers like that, and that meant to take it, to tape it. Uh, or he would yell at the secretaries and you know, tape this one. Um, there were times when Johnson, uh, when we would get some off Oval Office conversations that were taped via Johnson's speakerphone, uh, which were fascinating. So largely for LBJ too, they were manually operated of, the sorts, of a sort. Um, Nixon was entirely voice activated, and that was largely because the people who set it up uh, recognized, and Nixon recognized himself too, that he really wasn't uh, terribly adept at technology, and they were going to lose a lot uh, if they didn't have that kind of a system in place. So they decided to go with this voice activated system, and it starts two years into his presidency. Um, ultimately, it's because Nixon wants a couple things, a few things. Uh, he wants as the other presidents want to, to record for posterity what happened so they could write their memoirs more effectively. They wanted to know what was said in their presence so they could hold somebody's feet to the fire if need be. And for Nixon, uh, having the, the tape system made sense because previously he'd had a note taker in on a bunch of conversations and recognized that the presence of this other party really reduced the level of candor in those conversations. So they got the person out of the room and they put in the, the, the taping system. So um, that's a little bit more insight into, into why it is that we have what we have. Okay, thank you. A um, Couple more questions have come in. Uh, one from a Michael Weitzner. Hard to understand why a president would wanna tape themselves. Seems like it would just get them into trouble. Did they think they were immune? Uh, hi, Michael, first of all, uh, nice to hear from you. Uh, well, nobody thought that they would become public. Uh, there was um, little expectation that they would. Again, all of these materials, any material that a president is generating, um, 1962 through 1971, which is the years of, of, of kind of the golden age of taping, um, everybody expects to take that material with them uh, and do what it is they want. Uh, Roosevelt had established the, the, the practice of creating presidential libraries or building presidential libraries. And then he, he placed his materials there for people to see. And it was his, at his discretion of what he wanted people to see. And, and so the other, so the subsequent presidents um, 
operated according to that same logic. So nobody thought that, that these would become public. And Nixon fought tooth and nail to make sure that they didn't become public. Uh, there was a lot of wrangling from 74 through 78 by the time that, that Congress passed the, the Presidential Records Act. But then it went beyond that as well. Uh, the Nixon estate got very involved and Nixon himself got very involved over precisely what could be disclosed. And it was decided that the materials that were of a, of a purely personal nature uh, would not be disclosed, but other, other information or other, other materials pursuant to the president's discharge of his powers of office, those would all be made public. Um, and Nixon fought really hard. Um, but, but ultimately, we now have these 3,400 hours, which doesn't mean that, that there aren't materials that have been withheld. There are. Uh, there are about, I think it's about 700 hours of Nixon material that is still withheld, either because of reasons of national security or be, uh, because uh, they are of a personal nature and they are withheld in accordance with the deed of gift. And that's the same thing with Kennedy and Johnson too. It's, it's not as though everything that they recorded is out there for the world to see. There are some that are still classified and historians from time to time will file Freedom of Information Act requests to declassify them. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Michael Frazier. To what extent did the president play to the tape? Another great question. Uh, it's hard to know. We suspect that they probably were not because, uh, especially if you think about Kennedy in the middle of the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, who knows how it's going to come out? And it's hard to really make the call uh, as to what to tape and what not to tape, knowing what's going to make you look good in the end, if in fact this does become public. Uh, there is some evidence that Kennedy was, uh, was going to use these materials in real time, at least that's, that's what we had thought. Uh, Bobby had certainly listened to them by 1963, and we think that Ken, JFK was going to use them uh, in the course of his campaign, or at least draw on them for his campaign in 1964. But again, it's hard to know uh, what's going to make you look good. And then also, certainly for Nixon, since it's voice activated, um, in the spur of the moment, it's it's kind of tough to, to bifurcate and to go back and, and tell yourself that you're listening. With Kennedy and Johnson, yes, they're, they're manually operated, so they're aware of the, themselves taping. But I think more significant, um, the more significant conclusion about that is, is that, particularly for Kennedy, since there are far fewer hours than LBJ, uh, when Kennedy taped he was probably taping something that he thought was really important because there were comparatively fewer hours. So when he starts taping a lot on Vietnam in 1963, particularly at the end of the summer of 1963, that's when he's really devoting a lot of energy to it, not devoting a lot of energy to it before that, which again is another kind of aha moment, a way we can triangulate to think about what was on his plate, how much attention he was giving to it and how sound or unsound his policy was as a result. Hey, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, Bob Barnett. What presidential conversations are recorded presently? Formal meetings, diplomatic calls, and what discretion does the president have in this regard? Great question. Um, so we don't think that any president is recording in the same fashion that these guys did. Again, surreptitious secret recording without anybody else knowing. Um, you will always have, um, as was, as is the case with the Reagan tapes, which we're, we're also going to start transcribing this coming summer, uh, conversations with heads, foreign heads of state are, uh, are listened in on by, uh, by other presidential aides. They're, they're taking notes. They are making records of them, uh, potentially recordings. I think we had some of that from, from the impeachment, the Trump, in, the first Trump impeachment hearings. Um, and so, uh, so there's a record uh, of, of what's being said, uh, just so you can capture that. Um, we know that Obama, as I mentioned before, taped material, taped conversations with journalists, again, just to make sure there's a record, but we don't think that there's any of this secret nature going on. 
There was some suspicion at the outset of the Trump administration. If you recall that exchange he had with Jim Comey, uh, I think um, they were having dinner uh, in the east wing of the White House and they were next to a wall, next to a curtain. Was there a microphone back there? We knew Trump had taped as a private citizen. Might he be doing the same thing as a president? We don't know. Um, but you know, so far, nothing like that has, has come to light. And I think we might have found out if it had. In terms of discretion, the Presidential Records Act um, gives the president some discretion as to what gets retained and, and what doesn't, which is why over the past few years, there have been efforts on the part of Congress to strengthen the Presidential Records Act and make it um, and take it out of the president's hands, that discretion as to what they can preserve as a presidential record and what they ditch. Previously, the sense was, look, not everything that comes into a, a president's orbit is really relevant for historical purposes. The thousands and thousands of letters that come in every day, yeah, maybe you save a few, but you ditch a whole bunch of them. And so there were conversations that are supposed to take place between the president and the national uh, and the, the archivist of the United States. Um, guidelines are set for, for how to manage this. But the Presidential Records Act, as many people have pointed out in the last few weeks, as we've learned more about what happened during the previous administration, it really rests on an honor system. And as we've seen, an honor system isn't good enough. So uh, the, the efforts uh, of Congress to strengthen this and to set down some real hard and fast requirements is ongoing. Thank you. Uh, well, we're at almost eight o'clock. I've got five more questions. Uh, um, as much time, Mark, as you want to um, hang on for. Uh, um, we appreciate uh, um, your being with us. Uh, um, so uh, uh, let me know uh, if at some point you want to uh, wrap up. But at least the next question we had was, uh, do you know if the tapes were recorded somewhere in the White House or off site outside of the White House? And who actually hit the record button and put in fresh tapes. This is from Owen Alasco. Hey, Owen. Uh, uh, another great question. Uh, the Secret Service maintained these tapes uh, originally, uh, and then the White House Communication Agency did. Um, and they're the ones to store, uh, to administer the taping system. Um, so for, uh, for a while, uh, it was really only a handful of people who knew about it, particularly with FDR's system and then with Kennedy's system. I think at the outset, only four people knew about it and they were the ones to run it. And, and the, the wires went down to the basement of the White House um, from, the, from the Oval Office. Uh, now the tapes themselves, uh, uh, where were the presents when they were made? Again, they differed from Kennedy. It was really uh, uh, the Oval Office, the cabinet room largely, for Johnson, it was the Oval Office, the cabinet room, a little lounge that he had off of the Oval Office itself, residential quarters, and then at the LBJ Ranch. Uh, in fact, we're listening to a whole bunch of tapes right now about to publish on the, uh, the election of 1964. And Johnson's at the ranch a whole lot. And so there's a ton of tapes from there. Uh, and then Johnson is also tape, taping off site, uh, in fact during the whole Walter Jenkins scandal in October of 1964, um, LBJ's most trusted aide, uh, Jenkins gets caught up in what was called a morals scandal at the time and, and uh, resigns. Johnson is, is uh, talking to his aides back in Washington from a hotel in New York, I think the Waldorf, um, and through a system that the White House Communications Agency had set up. So they, they take place in a variety of locales. And again, Nixon, it's the White House residential quarters, uh, working quarters, residential quarters, uh, and at, um, at Camp David. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, another question from Eric Glover. Who among those on the XCOM during the Cuban Missile Crisis knew that the deliberations were being recorded? <laughs> it's a great question. We don't think that anybody did. Um, we know that by uh, August of 63, uh, Bobby had known about the tapes, 
But here, this is October 1962 we're talking about. So, so we don't think that any of those people um, knew about them. Kennedy did, Evelyn Lincoln did, its secretary, um, and then uh, Secret Service agents did. So, uh, you know, maybe Bobby had found out earlier in 63 when Bobby was speaking with LBJ after Johnson became president, he was well aware that he was probably being taped. And, and to your question, that's a really good example of somebody maybe watching what they, uh, what they said uh, to the president because they know that it's being uh, caught. Uh, but, uh, but for Kennedy, no, it was an incredibly small circle that widened. Um, I don't know exactly when it widened though. And um, there are others, uh, my former boss, Tim Neftali, uh, who is writing on Kennedy um, is is hopefully getting uh, getting to the bottom of this, or at least uh, helping us learn more about uh, how wide that circle really was. Thank you. Um, got three questions left. If uh, you got another couple of minutes, um, got a minute. Yeah. One uh, from Pam Molester. Even with the Presidential Records Act, doesn't it seem that we are now missing out on much important? information about presidential deliberations and discussions that would be relevant to history? Or do presidents now always do memcoms that reflect what occurred in conversations and meetings? Well, it's a great question and it's a great observation because we are missing out. Um, the White House is an oral culture. Um, so much happens in the hallways, uh, in the Oval Office, uh, again, assuming that, that no tapes are being made now. Uh, and it's really tough to capture the texture of these conversations and policymaking without recreating these conversations, certainly in real time, but even, even you know, immediately after the conversations take place. Uh, at one point, uh, that might have been written down in a diary. But as we learned through the 1990s and the Clinton scandals and saga, you write something down in the diary, um, that can be produced through a subpoena and it can be used against you. And so people started uh, to refrain from uh, putting their recollections down on paper. And we know that particularly because they've told us that. Uh, one of the other flagship uh, research programs at the Miller Center, Miller Center is the Presidential Oral History Program. Uh, which has conducted the official oral histories of presidents from Gerald Ford uh, all the way up through uh, George W. Bush, and is also doing a Barack Obama oral history program. Uh, we know that that these folks were skittish about about putting their recollections, their memories down on paper because they might be reproduced. And uh, to Pam's question, so so that's that's one challenge. The other challenge is, what do you do with all the email? that has just exploded over the years. And, and how, do we, how do we index that archive that make that available, um, preserve it? I mean, there were thousands of emails that were lost. You know, forget about whatever you wanna say about Hillary Clinton, uh, during the, 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 the Bush 43 years themselves. Um, and there was an effort to, to recapture some of those, but, but large amounts of them are still lost. So that's another challenge. And uh, the National Archives, dare I say, as hard as they are working to make this material available to generations of scholars and to the American public, um, there's just more and more these mountains continue to build. And it's going to be it's going to be a real chore to to process them and make them accessible in a way that allows them to be intelligible. Right. Um, last couple uh, for you. Uh, you had mentioned the National Archives. Had a question from Ed Slade. What role does the National Archives play in preserving the tapes? Uh, hey, Ed. Um, well, the Archives is the general custodian of, of these records. And so uh, all of the presidential libraries, which was where people would originally go to get the tapes, uh, are part of the National Archives system. Uh, the Nixon Library became part of the National Archives, and I think it was 2007, but prior to that, the Nixon Library stood outside of the NARA, National Archives and Records Administration, 
um, system. And so uh, there was a little bit of a wrinkle there. But yeah, NARA is the, the, the broad holding agency for all of these. Uh, and you, and you know, before the Miller Center did what it did and, and, and uploaded all these materials so that you could download these materials, uh, you could write to the archives and uh, ask for these tapes and for you know, a small processing fee, they could send them to you. Or you could go there yourself and, uh, and, and listen to them. Um, but yeah, people went to largely to the presidential libraries to do that. And prior to 2007, if you wanted the Nixon tapes, you would go to, I believe it was Archives 2 in College Park, Maryland. All right, and last uh, question to wrap up. Uh, I had similar um, inquiries from both Cleve Packer and a Rob. Basically, is there anything that you learned from the tapes that was recorded either intentionally or by accident that uh, you would want to share as an interesting story or um, a surprise of sorts? Uh, well, there are always surprises and they're all interesting. Um, and I don't know why, but as soon as, as uh, you, you uh, talked about a particular story or something maybe curious. I don't know why I thought of this one Kennedy uh, clip in which he's asking for those little blue pills. Now we know that Kennedy had his own Dr. Feelgood, which shot him up with all kinds of things, uh, who shot him up with all kinds of things uh, to keep him going. You know, in addition to all the, uh, uh, the drugs that he was taking for his many, many maladies. Um, when we heard that uh, Kennedy was asking, I think it was he was asking Evelyn Lincoln for, oh no, it was Dr. Dr. George Berkeley, his physician, for one of those little blue pills. Uh, that was something that we turned into one of these scrollers uh, as, as soon as we could because that was a that was a fun one. And then you know the, the most famous tape of all, I guess, in addition to the smoking gun tape, which is the tape that gives us all the rest of the tapes because the smoking gun tape is is what got Nixon in, into the hottest of water in Watergate. Uh, the most famous tape is Johnson's Hagar pants or Hagar slacks tape in which Johnson, uh, first week of, second week of August, 1964, in the middle of all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, signing uh, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and there are church bombings and he's got to pick a vice presidential running mate and he's about to go to, to Atlantic City for the convention. He calls up the head of the Hagar Slacks company, can you make me a pair of pants? And it is a graphic conversation about Johnson's uh, own personal needs of where he needs these pants to be taken out and why. Oh, great story. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, um, it's uh, 10 after eight. Thank you very much, Mark, for staying beyond the time that uh, um, was scheduled. Uh, I know we all appreciate it. Uh, um, and uh, again, thank you very much, uh, not only to those people that registered tonight uh, um, for what was a, a great evening of information, but Mark, uh, for your time as well and joining us and uh, um, enlightening us as to um, presidential recordings program and uh, uh, what you're doing. And um, as you said earlier, uh, you've got a book coming out. So by all means, uh, um, everyone should look for that. And uh, I wish you good luck uh, on that and uh, everything else. Great. Thanks. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.